lot of PIO3, and then we had a lot of you know, language models and how it plays a role in shaping our careers. But I think it's now time to move on to more fun stuff, as I like to call them. Uh, before, before I actually start my talk, I would like to have a quick show of hands. How many of you are into using AIs for different stuff, like content generation, coding, and things like that? Have you ever used an AI to generate the header, header image for your blog, like Mid Journey, Dali 3, and so on? Uh, so I, I think my talk is going to fit right in then, because I'm going to talk about image generation, but for free. To use Mid Journey and Dali 3, you have to pay, and so on. But my talk will show you how you can do similar stuff, but for free. Of course, you need to have access to a decent GPU, but things like Google Collab does give you a free GPU, so that should be enough. But I'm also going to cover video generation uh, a bit, so that's going to be exciting. Uh, so a little bit about myself. I work on diffusion models at Hugging Face. As a matter of fact, I get to maintain an open source Python library that's into uh, image generation, video generation, and so on. So it's called diffusers. How many of you know about Hugging Face, by the way? Oh, the, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good number. Thank you. I'm very, very deep into open source. I'm very proud to say that it was my open source contributions and my open source profile that got me into Hugging Face. So I'm very proud and very grateful for that. I'm big time into cricket. Uh, we recently won the T20 World Cup, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, and, uh, and my personal side is up here. Uh, and a couple of things before I start. Uh, so it's my first time presenting at EuroPython and my first EuroPython as well. I'll share my slides after my talk. And if I'm going too fast or if I'm going too slow, please do stop me. Uh, I have a very thick skin, so I won't mind. And there will be enough time for us to discuss Q&A and things like that. And moreover, I'll be around, so feel free to grab me for any questions related to careers at Hugging Face or what is it like to be working at Hugging Face and so on. So I have worked on language models for a fair bit, so can tackle those questions too. Uh, about the talk, I'll introduce image generation in a jiffy. I'll, I, I will keep, keep it mainly in the context of diffusion models because diffusion models are the powerhouse behind things like Mid Journey, DALI 3, Stable Diffusion, and so on. So it's safe to say that other things such as generative adversarial networks that used to do image generation, they are kind of dead. So it's safe to say that. And of course, I'll be talking about the diffusers library, which I get to dearly maintain at Hugging Face and the kinds of potentials it comes up with. And of course, I'm going to talk about the Pythonic aspects of diffusers and Q&A. There will be enough time for us to do Q&A. So era of diffusion models, text to image. So this is Stable Diffusion 3, uh, like the latest and greatest from St uh, Stability AI. It's an open model. And I hope we all can agree that a transparent sculpture of a duck made out of glass, these creatures cannot really exist in reality. But you know, with these models, these systems, they have got this you know, tremendous creative ability to come up with something that resembles our input prompt, like transparent sculpture of a duck. And then we have got Pixar Sigma, cute little panda, acting as a mad scientist. And then I have got an astronaut, popping out of nowhere in a jungle. Again, I think we all can agree that an astronaut in a jungle? Uh, not really, but yeah. And then we have got this very famous video from Sora, from OpenAI, where uh, that, that lets you generate videos, like long actual videos, resembling some kind of input description. I mean, let alone gener leave aside the generation part. We as human beings, we will definitely have hard time parsing the description on the right hand side. Like it's a very long, nuanced kind of description that we are seeing here. Like very minute details. Like as human beings, we will have hard time. Let alone uh, an AI doing it for us. But here we are. We are in 2024. It's absolutely possible. So yeah, if you haven't checked that one out, Sora, I definitely recommend you to check this video out particularly. And then diffusion models in a GP, I'm not going to go into the math, because it's very math scary. Even I get scary, scarified all the time whenever I'm reading a paper on diffusion models. So I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible. So the basic idea behind diffusion models is what happens when you try to refine a noise vector so that it becomes a realistic image over a period of time. And if I had to show you an infographic, this is how it would have looked like. 
So we are starting with a complete piece of jargon, and then we are slowly, slowly, slowly blooming it uh, to become a realistic image. And here's another way to take a look at it. So you see it's, it's very sequential in nature. It's not one shot unlike other image generation systems, such as generative adversarial networks. We are slowly denoising a piece of noise vector until, and un until, until it becomes a realistic uh, image. And then when you try to condition this whole you know, denoising uh, thing with text, for example this, it gives you things like this. So again, we hope we all can agree that this cute little fire monsters cannot really exist in reality, but here we are, so yeah. And then, then diffusion models, that, that gives you a lot of flexibility. Let me try to establish how. So text to image, imagine you are an artist, having some kind of image just from you know, natural language supervision, it should feel very liberating, right? Because you may be stuck in some kind of writer's block and you are unable to get some ideas out from your vague description in your, in your mind. But these systems that, they can be really helpful in order for you to get out of your writer's block. So text to image, it's very liberating and we can, you know, things like transfer and sculpture of a duck. But let's say your generated image is not so good, it's probably not following the input prompt in the way you would have expected it to be. So you wanted to condition the generation process with some, something more, let's say a pose. Let's say you wanted the generated image to follow a particular pose. And here we are, we, we, we can make that with a dance however we want to, so that's it. And then let's say you wanted to edit a particular side of image, but with natural language supervision, which is known as the task of image in painting. So that's also possible. Let's say you wanted to you know, change the castle that we are seeing on the left hand side with something else. You basically let the model imagine and that's it. So image in painting is another task that we get to do with diffusion models. And things like this, uh, they were not really possible with other image generation systems, such as GANs. So that's why I uh, you know, fixed uh, my core tooling to diffusion models, because they are very, very flexible. Now, some real use cases before I set the stage to, uh, and before I move on to other Pythonic aspects. So interior designs, let's say you are visiting a friend and you really like their interiors. Now you wanted something similar, but not exactly the same. So you could perfectly you know, capture an image of the interiors and ask a diffusion model to generate something similar, but not exactly the same. That's absolutely possible. So I, you, could, you could imagine companies like IKEA doing it all the time and think they are, they are using it at production, so that's good. And then fashion branding, like lots of e-commerce businesses are using it already. Amazon is using it, that I know for a fact. So that's pretty cool, right? So you can do things like virtual try-ons and add-ons, and things would just work, like different poses, different sketches, and so on, with some vague description, and it will just work. And then my favorite piece, it's like extended, extending creativity. So OpenAI actually, OpenAI actually did a formal study uh, with like lots of artists from all across the globe to see how you know, systems like DALI, uh, they are helping them out. And it turned out that systems like DALI are incredibly useful at you know, mitigating the writer's block that artists often you know, run into. So that's really, really cool. And here are some, you know, shifting gears a bit. Here are some examples of popular uh, text to image generation systems like DALI 3, then we have Imagine from Google, then we have the Stable Diffusion family from Stability AI, so that's good. But not all of these ones are open. So in order to be able to use DALI 3 and Midjourney, you have to pay uh, to open AI and Midjourney. Imagine, hell, you can't even use it other than from the Google Cloud API, so you'll again have to use it. But the entire stable diffusion family of models, that's open. And being open, what, what does it mean? What does it entail? So that's, that, that's what brings me to my next slide. We want to be able to study the risk factors, like are there any you know, safety threats? Uh, are there any you know, equity concerns that we want, to, uh, we want to get away from? Like we want to be able to properly evaluate the safety measurements before we end up deploying them in our business applications. And finally, we want to be able to build on top of them, right? Because we are in a Python conference, we are seeing so many open source Python libraries and so on. 
So we want something more in the open. We want something more out there in the wild so that you know other developers can potentially discover bugs and help us fix them and improve them in the long run, right? And stable diffusion from stability, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great example. So yeah, which I think uh, it's a perfect opportunity for me to you know introduce the diffuses library. It's a Python library uh, that's primarily maintained at Hugging Face with contributors from all across the globe. Now we have got two broad objectives with diffusers. So how many of you are aware of the transformers library? But that's good, it, it has like more than 100,000 stars. Only the second library to have done, done that in the context of machine learning, and the only one is ten, uh, TensorFlow. So it's a pretty big one, safe enough to say. So we, we have two broad goals. One is providing open and responsible ac access to state-of-the-art pre-trained diffusion models. And second is we want to democratize the ecosystem of diffusion models by making them as easy to use as possible for developers. And I'll, I'll get to the second point uh, in a bit. So this, the, our favorite astronaut popping out of nowhere in a jungle. So this is all the code that you need in order to generate it. And a free GPU that you will, you will get from Kaggle or Google Collab. So this is all, all, all the code. Or if you have an MPS MacBook with M1 or M2, you could use your MacBook to generate this right now. So this is all the code that you need in order to get from astronaut in a jungle cold color palette to the image that we are seeing on the right hand side. So it's just four lines of code since I care about things like indentation and clean code. I indented it, but you can imagine putting, putting it all up there in just four lines of code. So two lines for importing libraries, one line to specify which model that you are gonna use. We are using Stable Diffusion Excel here. And then another line to initialize the entire system, and then another line to define the input prompt, and voila, then we are ready, all done, right? And then if, if you are striving for photorealism, I'm sure this cactus can, cannot really, really exist, but then again, here we are. Again, just four lines of code and voila, you are done. And this is another model. This is not the Stable Diffusion Excel model. This is built on top of you know, things that are very similar to Stable Diffusion Excel, but it's not exactly Stable Diffusion Excel. So that's all possible. And videos. Here we are, um, making our dear Darth Vader serve a wave out of nowhere. So videos, these are extremely challenging, right? Because it, videos are not just some random collection of frames. It has to, be a, has to be ordered, right? It has to maintain some kind of, you know, tempo special, uh, you know, coherence. Like, it needs to maintain the time frames. It needs to maintain the spatial as aspects of the frames. So it becomes like 10x more complicated than just doing image generation. But the same lines of code. We are not doing any, anything to you know, solve the dynamics problem. We are not doing anything special to solve the spatiotemporal coherence problem. It's all the same lines of code. You are just changing the models and done. So if you were thinking like the APIs would change if you had to you know, complicate your problem a bit, no. We have taken care of that for you. Now you do your part, we will do ours. So yeah. This is all possible. So, you know, just having a pose of Darth Vader and some language supervision and having it generate a static 2D image, ah, sounds a little boring. How about we actually make Darth Vader dance? So this is all possible. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because this system, text to video zero, it lets you take any text to image model and convert it so that it becomes text to video. So you do not need to perform any kind of additional training to do like text to video generation. You, b you are basically taking an existing text to image model, you are modifying it in clever ways, and done. We can make our dart better dance. So that's good, actually for real, so yeah. There are many more tasks that are supported by our library, image to image synthesis, image editing with natural language constructs. So, so I, I am, I'm, not a I'm, I'm not a very good person that does Photoshop and things like that. So I want to be able to have a system that just takes, you know, edit instructions in plain language, plain English, and just be able to get done with it. So that's also possible, image editing with natural language instructions. And then we have got image to video translation. And Diffuses is not just a library for uh, images and videos. 
uh, audio is perfectly supported as well. So that's it. Uh, so we have got many more tasks. Feel free to check it out if some of these tasks are, uh, feel it, if they seem relevant to you. Now, coming to the more Pythonic aspects of things, I'd like to start with configuration management. So I'll, I'll, I'll have to you know, clear out a couple of confusions here. So usually when I say a machine learning model, it's just a single opaque model, right? But a diffusion model, it's not a single model. It's not. So we have got three, we have got a couple of text encoders. We have got the actual diffusion model, and then we have got some kind of decoder, and then we have got some kind of noise scheduler. So you do not have to know the nitty gritty of all these components, but just know that a diffusion model, it's not just about a single model. It, it is comprised of multiple different models, right? And, and, and like, let's, let's, let's get the chronology, let's get the order out here. So a cat looking like a tiger, so from this text prompt to get to that image, the flow would look something like this. The prompt will pass through the text encoders, which we may have two text encoders, we may have three text encoders. For example, Stable Diffusion 3, it has three text encoders, not just one. And then, and then it will, you will do some computation and the results will flow through the actual diffusion model and it's like sequential in nature like we saw uh, previously. It will also be accompanied with something called scheduler. Again, we do not have to worry about the details for now. And then the computations will flow through a decoder and then we will have our image. So it's like not just a single model, but a series of different models. So not single model, that's the most important bit that we need to remember. Now, the text encoders may have different sizes the diffusion, the diffusion model that we are using, it can have different architectures. The scheduler does not have any parameters, so it's probably just fine. And then the decoder, it can also have different sizes, right? So which means different sizes, different architectures, all of them can lead to wildly different configurations, right? So managing the entire configuration can be very hard. So we keep model parameters, like the actual weights of the model that we usually distribute, very separate from their configuration. So just to give you an example, so here I am loading some model from, from a pre-trained checkpoint, and then we are immediately assigning a config object so that you can you know, verify and investigate the config, all the model configuration in isolation. And it's gonna print something like this. Again, the nitty gritties are not important. I, the point I wanted to establish here is, it's perfectly possible to initialize an object from an existing configuration. Let's say you do not want to you know, initialize the model weights from a pre-trained configuration, but you only need the configuration. Just the configuration and you want to initialize it randomly. That's absolutely possible. So we have an API for, for like from config and that's done. So the way you would think in your mind, that's exactly how uh, we would do it in code. So that's one. And then it's also possible to you know, reuse an existing configuration and do some custom ones, like the one, in, uh, the one highlighted in yellow. So that's the custom, custom configuration argument that I'm passing. So that's also possible. And we want, if we, we promote reusability, like, like the hell out of it, and I'm gonna show you how. So reusing existing components of like a text to image generation pipeline to do on other things, it's absolutely possible. And you would want to do it to save memory. You wouldn't want to initialize different components because it takes a whole lot of memory. And as we saw, it's like three text encoders, a separate decoder, a separate diffusion model. It's like we're talking in 20 GBs of you know, GPU memory. It's very, very expensive. And you would want to you know, keep that as a commodity and you would want to rather promote reusability as much as possible. So here, I'm first initializing a text to image model and then I'm, I'm reusing the components of the text to image pipeline to initialize another image to image pipeline and that, that perfectly works. So that, that works, like from pipe and that's the API that we have. And then if you wanted to, again, similar to the configurations, if you wanted to sort of, you know, you reuse some existing components and pass on some custom components, that's also possible. So you have all the flexibility that you need with, you know, reusability, we will take care of the rest for you. And then if you wanted to swap out different pipeline components like we saw, like it will have a text encoder, it will have a diffusion model, it will have a separate decoder. So if you wanted to you know, initialize a pipeline with all the components from a pre-trained checkpoint, but you want to keep 
you know your your component of choice to your custom one that's also possible like the one highlighted in yellow that's possible so we have very you know clear separation of concerns and and, and diffusion pipeline is our class like the entry point to diffusers it it encapsulates all the logic for doing the entire diffusion process and it involves several components like we saw earlier a couple slides ago and we can swap out any of these components given we can ensure compatibility in between them so i feel that to be a very liberating point for me as a as a machine learning practitioner and then the, the i mean the point that i wanted to establish with clear separation of concerns is like all the components that we are seeing the unit the text encoder the scheduler the decoder all these components are swappable and rest of the components will load from the existing checkpoint as is so that's pretty convenient and then we strive to be as explicit as possible or rather than being implicit so by default all our pipelines and models are loaded on cpu until and unless you do the explicit device placement on gpus or any other accelerator you may have such as your macbook and all of the all of the models are kept in the floating point 32 numerical precision by default and as i mentioned users need to do the device placement or any kind of type casting explicitly and this is what i mean by that so if you if you have used pytorch the the development experience should feel very familiar so we are doing the down casting explicitly and we are also doing the device placement explicitly so yeah and we strive to be you know simple over easy the diffusion models can be very computationally expensive to run like five different components oh my god uh, and we do not but we do not perform any kind of optimization until requested but performing them is very simple thanks to the api design and this is exactly what i mean so this checkpoint this is table diffusion medium 3 if if we were to pop it on a cuda it's going to take at least 19 gbs of gpu vram even on a modern gpu like a100 or h100 like eight like 19 gbs of gpu vram that's a lot that's a lot that's not consumer gpu anyway right but if we call this little method enable model cpu offload it gets down to 12 gbs so simple over easy we have all the things that you need in order to uh, so in order to get you succeeded but you need to know them and using them is as easy, easy to you uh, is as simple to use as possible so yeah All right and minimal abstractions uh, so we do not tend to be a whole whole lot more abstractive we do not have as many abstractions that you may imagine so we we keep our abstractions to a bare minimum all our model classes extend from frame, framework primitives and this is what i mean by it so if you have worked with pytorch before you must be knowing something called nn module and all our modules inherit from nn module and we so we also support jax as a backend so we are a multi backend thing so we do not just support pytorch we also support jax and flex so that's good and for flex models we use a similar framework primitive native framework primitive and this way we we like keep all the implicit contract between the core frameworks to to none so that's pretty good and and diff diffuser is not just an inference tool uh, we in try to ensure accessibility like memory friendliness optimization and things like that if you wanted to train your own diffusion model that's also possible we've got a plethora of training examples for you to do that uh, and then we have got building blocks for you to do your research to do your experiment that's all possible and we provide customization at a pipeline level also at a component level because we understand we hear from developers time to time and we like to act fast you know listening to our community so we are a very much community driven library so i welcome you all to check it out and if you have any issues please let us know so our philosophy document it may feel a little weird to have all this philosophies down but we have an entire philosophy document which which might be helpful for you to you know think through some things like if you spotted anything that's not sitting right with you if you if you're feeling like it's a little anti pythonic in nature so there may have been a very well reason to have it that way so we have our little philosophy document and that's about it i think i have enough time for q and a so if you wanted to get access to the slides feel free to scan it and as a matter of fact this panda is also generated with stable diffusion 3 uh so yeah, i'll open up the floor for question and answers so please take it away
Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your awesome, awesome uh, presentation. Uh, I have one question. Is it possible to enhance the text to image process by my personal uh, photo library, for example? Yeah, it's possible. So we have something called subject-driven generation in our documentation. So if you head to our documentation, we have an entire section uh, on doing subject-driven generation. So let's say you wanted to have your you know, dog, and you want, if you wanted to have, have it rendered, I don't know, on top of that mountain, it's absolutely possible. So you just need to know the right techniques to do that. And it's all there in the documentation. Okay. So if you, if you are unable to sort of follow it through, feel free to shoot me an email or just open an issue. We'll be more than happy to help you out. OK, thank you very much. Perfect. Um, also, thanks for an awesome presentation. Um, thank you. Uh, my question is related even to the slide that you're showing here. You have this text, thank you. And probably everyone who played with image generation noticed that that's something that they struggle with. If you have some sort of text that you want to include in the image, you have like an awesome picture generated and then text is misspelled. Yep. Is there a way to improve accuracy of, of that text yeah. itself? Or is, are there any like hybrid models that actually create yep. text as a separate layer? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think you were referring to the problem of models, diffusion models misspelling a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like you wanted to have a placard saying some complex uh, piece of text and it's unable to do so. So I must say with Stable Diffusion 3, the problem has got reduced a lot. And then we have another upcoming model called Aura Flow. Uh, spilled a little bean there. So Aura Flow is definitely going to be better at spelling more textual content in the generated image. But if you wanted to have like utmost flexibility, then I welcome you to check out a framework called AnyText. It's built on top of Diffuses. And it enhances uh, the you know, text spelling capabilities by like 10x. It's very good. It's called AnyText. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hello. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, is it possible to use this technology to enhance images uh, that were shoot on high ISO? Images that? Uh, so you imagine if you if you're a photographer and uh, you are uh, taking images on high ISO, um, you will have lots of noise in the yep. images. Yep. So is it possible to actually reduce the amount of noise or even remove it? Yeah, so we have something called upscalers. Uh, so if you have like an image that you feel like is not up to the mark where you would have wanted it to be, so you could just pipe it through the upscaler pipeline and sort of refine it over a period of time. So you make a one, you make a single pass, then you have some output. Probably you are not that satisfied. Then you can feed it back to the uh, upscaler again and then just see what happens. And you have also little knobs and tricks, like how much denoising to apply, at what point in time the denoising uh, to apply, and things like that. So it's, yeah, so long story cut short, it's possible. Okay. Search for upscalers. OK. Yeah, upscalers and diffusers. Is it also uh, able to work with high resolution images? Yeah, yeah. So okay. The, the images that I showed you, it's like 2048 by 2048. So okay. by default, we are talking about high definition images. OK, so thanks. Thank you. Hi, uh, Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, I was just uh, thinking about video generation. Can you maybe just uh, elaborate some more on that? Is it frame to frame? Is the video generation uh, like constrained on the previous frames that were generated? I recently saw the video of some gym, like generated video of some gymnasts making strange moves. Uh, as I understand, this is because no motion information is, in incl is included in the in the video generation process, but how can we constrain it to to, to better uh, generate, yeah. generate so the videos? Text to video, it's not a solved problem. Nearly as solved as text to image generation. So when it comes to videos, there are a lot of things that are at play. So previous frame, it's just one part of the play, right? Second, you'll have to you know care about the motion dynamics and so on. You have to be uh, you have to care about the motion creativity and so on. And then you'll have to care about the spatio-temporal coherence, like OK, you maintained the previous frame consistency. You maintained the motion consistency. But how, how are the frames individually looking like? And if they are looking, like, if they are looking as expected on an individual level, are they like, temporally well connected? So there are multiple things that are, that are at play here. So, and there are also lots of trade-offs. Like when it comes to you know, short videos, like 10 seconds videos and so on, 
it's probably okay with things like text to video, you can get away with that because you do not have to worry about the motion dynamics a whole lot if you have like a very short video. But the moment you, you know, raise your bar to very, very long context videos, we have got a lot of roads to cover. So uh, I would say better constraining, better frame consistency and things like that, these are still a very active area of research. I'll give you one framework that's being used these days. So what you do is first you, you predict some kind of a motion, motion path, like for 10 seconds you have some kind of an arbitrary motion path and then you have your first frame and then you sort of interpolate it with respect to the motion path that, that you had initially predicted with the language supervision that you have in your mind. So that, that's like the stepping stone that people follow these days, but there's a lot to be done. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Thanks for the result. Um, I would, my question is about security. I would like to know if it's possible for a model to uh, end up executing code on the CPU, and uh, if you download a model on a hugging face, uh, is it possible? You, you it wanted, wanted a model that can execute code on CPUs. I don't want that. I would, I would like to know if, if it's possible that you download some malware included in Yes. A, so we have got something called agents, code agents, within the transformers library. A language model itself cannot run it, but you need to augment, with, augment it with some kind of agentic approach so that it can understand and call up an agent appropriately and make it, the, make it do the stuff that you are looking to do. So you would probably want to look for something called transformers agents uh, that can run code. Uh, in the way you are expecting it but, to be. Uh, on Hugging Face, is there some, some um, uh, teams that are uh, assigned to the security side of yeah. stuff? Do you, do you uh, have some scans of uploaded model to ensure that it does not contain any uh, malware? Yes, yeah. yes. Good news is yes. So we have got a hub scanning tool that runs on all the public models that we have on the Hugging Face Hub platform. And if it finds any vulnerability, it's gonna, it's gonna let you know. So I think two years back, there was a vulnerability discovered with Pickle uh, that used to be like the de facto tool in the machine learning community for serializing and distributing models. And as soon as that was, fi uh, that was fo uh, found out, we invented our own file serialization uh, thing called safe tensors, and we also ended up uh, inventing our you know code model scanning tool. So yes. So long story cut short, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Looks like. Oh sure. Go ahead. Please. So yeah, great talk. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on why diffusion models took off in the imagery and vision domains, but not in text, and why text is currently yes. LLM autoregressive based. Yes, yes, I, I, was, I was reading over the mathematical foundations of it just last night, so yes, <laughs> uh, I'm, in, I'm in the right place. So text, text by, by nature, they're very discrete in nature, the thing is, the, the core formulation of diffusion models is based on score matching, and if, if you wanted to compute the gradients of the score that we end up back propagating, they do not have very good characteristics in the discrete space. Yeah, so the characteristics only work and tend to behave well when, when you have a continuous space, such as videos, such as audios, and such as images. So long story cut short, if you are operating on the discrete modality, the score gradients are not going to be as useful as they would have been for continuous modality. So. Okay, that's, that's cool, yeah. 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 All right. uh, I think I'll be around, so feel free to grab me for more questions if you have any, but otherwise have a great conference. Thank you. <laughs>